First off, if you only click this video to see the geysers and chains room, you can go ahead and jump to this time code. Hello everyone, Wylock here. Thanks for joining me. Welcome back to our complete build of White Plume Mountain. Stuff that's generally applicable to the dungeon was addressed in the first video. If you haven't seen that one, I recommend you check it out. But today I have four new rooms for you, so let's go jump in. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Picking up at room number five, numbered golems. Five flesh golems are clustered against the north wall. Each has a number on its chest, five, seven, nine, 11, and 13. One of them doesn't belong and the correct choice is nine because it's not a prime number. This is easy. I printed and painted five of these Frankenstein-like minis to stand in as flesh golems. And they really don't have any room on their chests, but they have a nice shoulder pad feature. So I painted the numbers on those instead. And that's all of room five, easy enough. You know, I guess the implication is that in Greyhawk, their understanding of mathematics has advanced to the point that prime numbers are recognized as a thing. Actually, this encounter further implies that they've chosen to recognize the base 10 system of numbering in the first place. And I don't know about that. I think a sufficiently advanced arch wizard, given the opportunity to start from scratch, would have chosen to recognize base 12, not base 10. There's actually a real life movement with a lot of support behind it that we should be using a duodecimal system, not the decimal system. It's called dozenalism, and it makes a lot of sense. Division is easier, it's got a lot more ties to real life applications, and it's more aligned with how our brains are hardwired. I think forcing the base 10 system on a group of creatures that you just forced to become sentient in the first place is just doubly irresponsible. But where was I? Area six, turnstile. Short flight of stairs leads up to a dry corridor and just around the corner is a turnstile. Let's look at the artwork from the original printing of the module. Revolutionary stuff. I'm gonna make a double wall clip-on. I don't think I've ever made one before. This is for two reasons. Number one, I wanna represent those poles sticking out of the wall because this thing only turns counterclockwise. It'd be kind of silly to illustrate if you didn't have a way to restrict the characters just going 360 and walking back through. And also because the central pole, that central turnstile is gonna be pretty fragile. I'd like to have something to protect it. Walls will do that. So I prepared two clip-ons as normal, chipboard sandwiching double corrugated in the middle, Put them on the hallway so that I could measure out a true width and then cut a ceiling for that. And to give it some girth, double corrugated and chipboard again as well. I know I'll be using a wooden dowel for the central pull of the turn style, so I found the center of the ceiling and punched a hole through it. Then clad the whole thing in tin foil and gave it the usual Mod Podge and paint job that all of the other walls get. For the actual protruding bars, I'm using toothpicks. The ones coming out of the wall will come out of these like ornate bead things. I just needed something to house them and give some connective strength. So those get put in, super glued, and then the whole assembly is hot glued to the wall. Once those are in place, I could mark out on the central pole where the opposing or like teeth, the interlocking arms would go. And I used my pin vise to drill holes, to put the toothpicks through, chop them to length, and secure them in place just sort of by slathering with some super glue and using accelerant. Here it is dry fitted. You can see it fits perfectly. I'm not gonna leave this unsecured so that it can rotate. Um, but right here in this video, if I ever wanna see it, I can look back and see, yeah, at one time it did rotate. The turnstile just gets a simple overbrush with gunmetal and maybe some speckling with metallic copper. I also punched a hole in the floor of the tile that this will go into. I'm okay doing this because that's all this tile's ever going to be used for. It is specifically for this dungeon. It'll be in this box. I'm never going to use it anywhere else. And this is what it looks like to clip it on. Pole goes in the ground, the two clip-ons on the wall, and this, wow, this is really, really sturdy. I love it. And man, I think it looks the part. I think it matches the original artwork really well. By that, I mean it looks really stupid being in a dungeon. Here we go, room seven, geysers and chains. The door opens onto a stone platform in a large natural cave. There's another platform on the far side and between them is a series of nine wooden discs suspended from the ceiling 50 feet above by massive steel chains. The floor is a pool of roiling, boiling mud. There's also two large geysers in that boiling mud. The discs themselves are about four feet in diameter, three feet apart. They swing freely and tilt when weight is placed upon them. And the discs and chains, as well as the walls of the cavern, are all covered with a wet, slippery algal scum that gives off a feeble phosphorescent glow. 
Let's get a look at the artwork side by side from each of the three printings of the module. Okay, fairly similar. Now this tile does not need to be as big as the map makes it, even our modified map. So I'm gonna make the tile as small as I can. I do have to store it after all, and I don't wanna make this one in two pieces. I'd like to be self-contained. So cut out a nice big square. I think this is six by six units. Laid out a path of nine washers to kind of help myself visualize. Now, the entrance and exits still do need to be on the grid for everything to line up in general. So you can see I'm measuring along the edge two and a half inches in and five inches on the other side, roughly sketching the location of everything in the walls and then going at it and cutting out the tile. The walls, as usual, are gonna be a half inch tall. So I cut out a nice length and then kind of pre-bent it to the shape of the tile. Now, you wanna hot glue this on a little bit at a time, say six or eight inches, so that you can use all of your fingers to hold it in place as the glue is cooling. It's not gonna be possible to maintain all those curves for the entire distance at once. Texturing the walls, I'm taking a page out of my own book like we did the Underdark tiles a couple years ago. Remember that episode? If not, there's a card on the screen right now. Anyway, we lay out a thick bead of hot glue and then pull upward with the nozzle and sort of tease the hot glue upwards to give the idea of stalagmites. Once again, dry fitting the washers to mark out where I'm gonna punch each hole. And these are drink stirring sticks like you get from a party store or the dollar store. Some of them are clear, perfect for holding up the discs and making it look like they're floating or rather hanging by chains. Now, after punching a hole in the cardboard and testing, this is very flimsy, right? This is, this is not the final state. We're gonna take care of that, rest assured. For the geysers, graphics medium chipboard, cut a strip, bend it into a circle and hot glue it on. And look at these, hemispherical bead sheets. I've used these before. A lot of crafters on YouTube use these. Great for doing bubbles. There we go. A couple clusters of different sizes. And keep in mind, if you want to make something sort of look natural, don't evenly distribute things. That's not random. What is random, what tends to look better, is if you cluster things together. And then on to the good stuff. Yeah. Sculpt a mold. We're going to use this to fill out the texture of the room. It's going to be two parts of the powder to one part water. mix it up real good and then spread it on i'm using it to sort of build a ramp for the geyser on the inside smoothing it out with my finger this is a heck of a lot easier to do than with hot glue and it also is going to look better same thing for the outside sort of ramping up to it and here's how we solve the strength problem for those clear posts i built up sculpt -a mold around them in a small mountain like a few millimeters high, just enough to create a keyed entry for the post. So putting a glob on there, inserting the post, and then sort of squeezing it in around it to make that small mountain. And once this dries and fully cures rock hard, my hope is that it will be a perfect keyed entry and I can remove these things at will for storage because I don't want to store them like this in the box. They're going to get beat up. Next day, fully dried and hardened, and a twist, they come out perfectly. Reinserting it, there's a little bit of resistance, good friction, perfect. Yes, I love it when a plan comes together. Flawless victory. Also gonna add a little whirlpool effect within the body of the geysers. Well, let's put the tile aside for a sec and talk about the platforms. I figured out the nominal center of gravity or center of weight for a typical 28 millimeter miniature with the understanding that the chain is going to be connected to the center so the miniature will not be able to stand on the whole platform. They're going to be leaning off some unless I make the platforms like really huge and I don't want to do that. So these circles of graphics medium chipboard have a diameter of 32 millimeters. They also texture really well. Using a ballpoint pen, check this out, I'm going to create the planks of wood, and then with a very fine-tipped awl, awl, I'm gonna lightly scrape and create the wood grain. Then for strength and stability, hot gluing a washer on the underside, and then the whole thing gets a Mod Podge. 
I was careful to spread this out kind of thin uh, or just keep working it so that I don't fill in all that detail with gobs of Mod Podge. When trying to figure out how to do the chains, I just did a quick Google search and lo and behold, Jeremy did this already. So I'm gonna go ahead and use his technique. This is my trusty Surebonder silicone mat. Nothing sticks to it. So I laid out this chain I had around, put on some super glue and sprayed accelerant. However, this chain is a little bit too bulky, a little bit too big. This didn't work great. It buckled under its own weight and did not stay rigid. So I pulled out this necklace chain that I had on hand. A little smaller, doesn't quite look like a chain, but mm, that's okay. Dragging super glue along it to let it seep in, hit it with the accelerant, and this'll work. So I chopped those to like a two inch length or something, and then super glued them to the discs. Painting, very easy. The chain will get gunmetal, and then the base of the disc will get burnt umber. Followed by a dry brush with a honey brown, easy. Now for that faintly phosphorescent algal scum, I went over to my rarely used Vallejo effects paints. They sent me these a couple years ago, and every so often I find something cool to do with them. I got a dark grime, a light grime, because those are different apparently, and then a moss and lichen, this yellow, which I'm hoping dries to sort of a textured thing. I'm not really sure. Here's a couple test swatches I did. But ultimately, you just gotta try it. You gotta go for it. So I put some on the platform. As they were drying, I could already tell I wasn't gonna be super impressed with the results. So I dabbed them out and sort of faded the edges, did some dabbing. I don't know. Yeah, once it's dry, it, it basically just looks like dried mustard colored paint. I, I think that's all it is. But it could be a good base for this neon green. Being that it's yellow, I could end up with a nice, faintly phosphorescent, sickly result. So I'll give that a shot, and while that's drying, back to the tile. First up, dry brushing with a light grayish, easy enough. Oh, and letting all that detail do the work. Man, I will tell you, there's nothing more satisfying than letting your terrain do the work for you when you're painting. You put in the effort to texturize it and get as much interesting stuff in there before priming as you can, and oh, it is so fun and easy to paint. Raw Umber, this is just a nasty sort of desaturated dark brown. I'm gonna use this mop brush and go nuts. Yeah, this is exactly what I was talking about a second ago. I'm gonna let you have some visual ASMR for a moment. And then this color is called maple syrup, repeating the same thing as we just did. A little less paint, a little less pressure so that I'm not covering up all of the previous color. The idea here is build up via overbrushing as opposed to building down with washes. For a final highlight color, I thought I would try like a gray after doing some Google image search. This is gray owl, but I quickly realized I, I was not happy with this. It was gonna, I could just tell if I went on for the whole thing, it was gonna ruin it. So I quickly took a rich brown, this is bark brown, whatever, and mixed it like 50-50 with that gray on the palette and then went back to dry brushing. And that gave me more of what I wanted, color. I like color, I like contrast, I don't like realism. I like seeing color being used. And then real quick in my airbrush, I put in a sickly yellowish brown and highlighted the surface of all those bubbles, which again are very smooth because I did that little wash of them while the sculpted mold was still wet. And as the module describes, the walls also get that treatment with the phosphorescent algae. Attaching the discs was pretty easy. Here's how I did it. A bit of hot glue on the washer underneath. That's metal, so it's gonna cool very quickly. So I set it quickly. And that little recession, the hole in the middle of the washer is a good place for the hot glue to seep in. You get lots of surface area, and these are very strong. So here it is going into that keyed entry, 
perfect and it's very strong. I knock on it with the weight of my hand and it's, it's staying there. Awesome. I'm going to save the big overview of this finished room for the end of the video. For now, let's move on. Room 8, Coffin. The door opens into an area of utter blackness, which is magical, but really this is the lair of a vampire named Ketenmir. Stenmir. Chenmir? Kuth I don't know how to pronounce that. But he's compelled by a curse to remain here in a trance, except when roused to defend his treasure. Alright, so it's a dark room with a coffin and a vampire. Could have, could have just said that. Could have just said it. The body of the coffin is food box card stock that I pre-measured out lengths and then lightly scored halfway through so that they'll fold very neatly and at predictable points. I cut out that strip, did the bending, and hot glued in a slab of foam board to help it keep its shape. Then I traced it onto dollar store foam board and cut it out with, I don't know, three or four millimeters outside of that tracing so it's a little bigger. I did that twice, peeled off the paper, usual aluminum foil ball for texturing, and then glue it all together. I wish I were more creative and could come up with something for the lid, but I really couldn't, so I just sort of carved in a perimeter and maybe something will come to me later on. But then the whole thing gets the podge. Yep, healthy coat of Mod Podge, then black, then dry brush gray. While that was drying, I took a wooden dowel and slathered it with this antique gold color. Very nice. And then I chopped short lengths to glue in between the lower and upper lids. Now to cut a wood dowel like this, you can use your crafting knife, your Olfa knife. Roll it as you cut. Don't try and just press down, don't try and saw. Roll it using the blade a few times back and forth and it will chop very cleanly. Then those are just fixed in place with a little bit of white glue. And that's looking pretty good. Mm. Uh. Yeah, we're gonna do it. This needs a happy little gem. I'll just glue that in the top. Hey, maybe this thing is magical. Maybe this is what's keeping the curse on him to keep him in the trance. There, I justified it. You know, I've been buying a lot of STLs lately for my 3D resin printer. It's sort of becoming a problem, but one of them is this awesome vampire. I will probably print a second one for my general collection since this one needs to live in the box with this dungeon. As we take a couple minutes to survey what we've built today, let's read a little more about White Plume Mountain. It is an almost perfectly conical volcanic hill formed from an ancient slow lava leakage. It is about 1,000 yards in diameter at the base and rises about 800 feet above the surrounding land. The white plume which gives the mountain its name and fame is a continuous geyser that spouts from the very summit of the mountain another 300 feet into the air, trailing off to the east under the prevailing winds like a great white feather. The spray collects in depressions downslope and merges into a sizable stream. There are steam vents in various spots on the slopes of the mountain, but none of them are large enough to allow entry. The only possible entrance into the cone is a cave on the south slope known as the Wizard's Mouth. This cave actually seems to breathe, exhaling a large cloud of steam and then slowly inhaling like a man breathing on a cold day. Each cycle takes about 30 seconds. Approaching the cave, the party will hear a whistling noise coinciding with the wind cycle. If it were not for the continuous roaring of the plume, this whistling could be heard for a great distance. The cave is about 8 feet in diameter and 40 feet long, and at the end, near the roof, is a long horizontal crevice which is about a foot wide. The air is sucked into this crack at great speed, creating the loud whistling and snuffing out torches. Shortly, the rush of air slows down, stops for about two seconds, and then comes back out in a great blast of steam. This steam is not hot enough to scald anyone who keeps low and avoids the crevice, but it does make the cave very uncomfortable, like a very hot sauna bath interrupted by blasts of cold air. The ceiling and walls of the cave are slick with the condensed steam which runs down them. The floor is covered with several inches of fine muck. Only careful probing of the muck near the back of the cave reveals a small square trap door with a rusted iron ring set in it. I wonder if I should back up and model that in the next episode. I didn't talk about the entrance. Anyway, once the muck is cleared away, it will require at least three characters with a lot of strength to pull up the encrusted door. 
Directly beneath is the 20-foot square vertical shaft with the spiral staircase leading down to room one. Coming together nicely, that whole first branch of the dungeon is done. Two more to go. If this is the first video of mine you've discovered, I have a whole backlog of videos like this, and come find us on the Tabletop Crafters Guild on Facebook. Almost 40,000 members. Until next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games. Music